in sandboxes where we can play with things without parents thinking it will endanger their kids' future career. There's a lot of need for rapid experimentation in higher ed. So I would, I would leave us with, think about the possibilities, creating that experimentation space and where it might take us. Welcome to the Leadership and Legacy podcast, where we interview inspiring CEOs, entrepreneurs, and software leaders who are building remarkable companies and legacies in the world. I'm your host, Austin Yoder, founder of Magrathia Partners, an entrepreneurial investment firm dedicated to acquiring and growing one great founder-owned software company. As part of my journey, I'm learning from inspiring leaders and builders and gathering the most valuable insights and advice I learn along the way here with you, my wonderful audience, so that we can learn and lead better together. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that you'll find as much value and insight in the show as I do. Welcome back to the Leadership on Legacy podcast. Today, we have the honor of being joined by Sarah Beckman. Sarah is a teaching professor and the Earl F. Chite Faculty Fellow at Berkeley. She is an expert in integrating design critical and systems thinking skills for framing and solving problems in multidisciplinary teams. She teaches across the school on innovation, design, problem solving, framing problems as questions, um, and is a, a mentor and respected advisor to many entrepreneurs who come out of the Berkeley ecosystem. We are very grateful to have you here with us today, Sarah. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I would love to kick us off and just start with a little bit of a, an introduction to your background. You've been in and around higher ed for a number of years, and you really have seen the space evolve. Can you just introduce yourself and your background in higher ed a little bit? I've been around higher ed for a, a long time. I joined the business school at UC Berkeley over 30 years ago and was one of the first people there who did case study teaching. It's been at Harvard for a long time, so that wasn't new to the world of education, but it was to the business school at Berkeley. And, and I think what's at the heart of, uh, two things really at the heart of my engagement in the education world, one is trying new things, maybe because I get bored, so I try new things. So case study teaching was a fun new way to, to shift away from lecture-based teaching, um, and then moving into project-based learning, and then really trying to think about flipped classrooms and very experiential learning, whether project-based or not. I just think the world is inherently multidisciplinary. And so it's always been important to me to bring disciplines together, both in my thinking about my own work, but also in the classroom. You know, in the early 1990s, uh, before it was a thing, I created a course called Managing the New Product Development Process that I taught jointly with Alice Agagino, who's on the faculty in engineering. Um, and we brought together engineering students, business students, and design students from the California College of the Arts, because Berkeley didn't have a, a design program at that time, to, to take an idea through to first pass prototype during the course of the semester. And all that sounds totally normal now, but in the early 90s, that kind of wasn't a thing. So I still play in those spaces. What are creative ways that we can help students learn through experience in using the content that, that we're trying to teach them. My latest integrated class was called Collaborative Innovation, which was taught jointly among theater, art practice, and the business school. But there were three faculty from each department and then teen different majors of students in the class. So we would put students in these fabulously diverse teams with very different perspectives about how to approach problems, how to think about them. And then we would teach how each of us goes through the innovation process. What does it look like to create art? What does it look like to create a performance piece? What does it look like to design a business? It turns out underneath all that, there's kind of a common thread of how we frame and solve problems. So really this notion of how do we create experiences and then help students take away from those experiences in this case, how to collaborate better and how to innovate better. And then bringing together the perspectives of multiple disciplines has been really fun. So that's kind of been the, the culmination in the last few years of that iterative process of thinking about what we're creating for students and, and what they can learn from one another, not just from faculty across the disciplines on that on the campus. I'm an industrial engineer by training, so I'm kind of an engineer. 
we're what people call imaginary engineers if they're from computer science or mechanical engineering, but there you go. So I'm very process oriented person and that's a lot of what I've brought. I've taught operations, I've taught new product development, I've taught innovation, design, all those different topics. So that's kind of the quick version of a history. Amazing. Um, before we move on, I'd just be curious with that very interesting mix of people, any favorite examples come out of that of some insight or innovation that resulted from someone from theater and business and engineering, like all of these different backgrounds just gelling together? People took on things like mental health challenges on college campuses, which is not a new problem. But there's another group that this one was really fun. They went around campus and they interviewed just random students on campus. And they asked, first they said the question, how did you really screw up in high school? They used a different term, but I'll, it's a podcast. So how did you really screw up in high school? And so all these people would say, oh, I watched too much TV, or I, I started doing drugs, or I, um, you know, they'd name all these things that, that happened to them in high school. And then they would say, but you're at Berkeley now, how'd that happen? And people would tell the story. So these incredible, powerful video of, you know, it's okay to make mistakes in your life. You know, you can, you can recover. So there was, a, there's some quite beautiful things that are at the intersection of, of types of expression, types of interacting with other people in order to get to that expression. And then the other wonderful thing to me is that when we ask for reflections at the end of the semester, people talk about how much they learn about themselves from working on teams with people who came from such completely different backgrounds than they did. So there's lots of fun stories, but those are a couple. So you've, you've been around these interesting spaces since the early days of even teaching case studies at Berkeley. How would you say product management, design, innovation, how have these topics evolved in higher ed? Um, since you started in this space yourself? Part, I hope, of their evolution in higher ed is the result of their evolution in practice. So, you know, we started a product management executive program at Berkeley not quite 20 years ago now. And back then, product management was just starting really to be an important role in, in organizations. And today, of course, we have internal product managers, we have external product managers, we have feature product managers, we have portfolio product managers. So, so the question then becomes what's driving that? And that's totally connected to design and innovation, right? Because product managers are at the center of design and innovation in most organizations these days. What's happened that's driving that? In simple terms, it's the change in technology curve, right? That technology was changing at an exponential rate, but we were on the flat part of the curve until kind of right around COVID, right? We, we turned the corner on the curve and had COVID at the same time. Where we are today then is in a place of, if you watch Black Mirror, Black Mirror is this dystopian view of the future with technology in it. We're now faced with the very real possibility that we will create hundreds of Black Mirror episodes, unless we really say, hey, that's a very cool technology. On the other side of it is a human being. How do we want to live? How do we want to work? How do we want to learn? Like, what is it that human need, want, et cetera, out of life? And how do I marry that with the technology? This is my point of view, but in my point of view, we have to be human-centered when we think about these things. Like there's a lot of focus on the, the technology and the business case, and, and we're trying to make sure the human is in there as well. So that's kind of, to me, how those have evolved. Fascinating. And yeah. I think that's a really interesting segue into my next question too, which is, how do you see higher ed broadly evolving over the next five to 10 years? You phrase the question so it begs two different answers. How will it evolve is a little different than how it might evolve. But let's set the stage though and say, in effect, I can get a college degree online now for $100 a course. If I go to someplace like Coursera, I can get a whole bunch of college courses and I could go to some university, get a list of everything that I'm supposed to take to get a degree in mechanical engineering or English, and I can go on Coursera and I can find those courses and I could take them all. So we need to be thinking about that if we're in the bricks and mortar higher ed business. 
because our product is now priced effectively at, at a much lower level. Okay, so next question then becomes, well, do companies use college degrees as a determinant of whether they'll hire somebody? And of course they do, until you push them on it. So this is linked to another observation. Ten years ago, if you go on somebody's LinkedIn page, there were maybe two or three certifications at the most, if there were any, right? There's a college degree and a certification. Now you have to click to open the 18 certifications that people have. Now I'll go back to those companies. What are the companies doing? Well, they'll tell you they hire people with a college degree. But then when you push them and say, well, what about all those certifications? They'll say, well, you know, there is a shortage of this kind of engineer in my industry today. So we didn't actually hire only college graduates. We hired the ones who were certified in technology A, B, and C. So this whole system we have that we hold together, if you haven't read Excellent Sheep, it's, it's worth reading. It's Excellent Sheep is a book about how the treadmill has started running faster and faster since roughly the 1970s, and we put our high school kids on it, and then we just run it, and you know, they straight A's and perfect SATs and, you know, eight club activities, and then they get to college, and they, they try to run even faster, and so we've, we've created a system that's incredibly painful for parents, for students, for, you know, high school teachers. There's the excellent sheep kind of treadmill. There's the fact that I can get a, all kinds of certifications. I can educate myself today. I've got these mechanisms by which I can self-educate. Companies are recognizing those mechanisms in their hiring, at least starting to. So then I have to really think about what is the purpose of, let's call it bricks and mortar, higher ed, right? What's its role? They, so Sel Khan, who runs Khan Academy, wrote a book called One World Schoolhouse. And in that book, he says, in the last chapter, if you don't want to read the whole book, read the last chapter, um, he said, what if the university were a place in Silicon Valley, he just chose, but could, you place it anywhere, right? where companies throw problems into it and students just solve them for four years, four years, two years, who cares? But let's just keep with some of the structure of, of higher ed currently. So this could be, I could throw climate change problems and there could be, it doesn't have to be Silicon Valley company. Oh, so then you begin to think about what if the university were anchored around solving problems that matter? Whatever those problems might be or wherever you might source them, suppose that as a student, that's what I do for four years. So then you think, okay, and that in turn creates what I call demand pull for what we teach now is the core content, finite element analysis or conjoint analysis. Name some content that's taught in the university. If I structure those problems well, you know, they'll create, create demand pull for different kinds of content. My simple version of the business school in this sense, right? The, you get, you start four companies while you're there. The first one, you have to find product market fit. So that's demand pull for marketing courses, right? And some strategy course. And the second company, you have to get funding. So now you get demand pull for finance and accounting. And then the third one, you're, you're actually launching. Ah, so now I need operations and I need organizational behavior. Think about this series of projects and I will learn the core content that right now, for example, the MBA program, we put all that in the core. So in the first year, open your brain, let me fill it up. And then the second year we say, ah, now let's apply that. My experience with that, because I do a lot of the applied classes, is you come to something like, well, how are you going to price that product? Oh, well, I don't know. Well, what'd you learn about pricing? I think we had a lecture on that last year in marketing. So the ability to pull the content when you need it and apply it when you need it causes you to actually deepen your learning about it. And where is all that core content? It's online. So I, I just need to curate it. I need to curate it so that when somebody's working on one of those problems that matter, they know where to go. They know what to look for. So they're not going to know that finite element analysis exists, but I have to guide them to that. You were going to lead later to this question of barriers. Barrier is 
we have a notion that if I'm not the one who stood up in front of the class as a sage on the stage, then they couldn't have learned it properly, which is clearly not the case, right, in any number of, of topics. Okay, so I've got solving problems that matter, creates demand pull for core content. So then I, then I ask myself, well, so what do students really need to be able to learn in order to solve problems that matter with the core content? Well, they need two fundamental things. One is they need to actually explicitly learn how to frame and solve problems. And I'll come back to a deeper dive on that. But they have to learn how to frame and solve problems. And they probably aren't going to work alone. So they need to learn teaming. So now you can get, begin to imagine that I have some scaffolded curriculum about problem framing and solving and some scaffolded curriculum about teaming that that, that students evolve over, if we want it still to be four years, we'll call it four years, whatever, right? But the, that evolves over those four years so that they exit university with deep, deep understanding of how to frame and solve problems, how to pull on existing knowledge that's out there and apply it, and how to work with other people when they do that, ideally in multidisciplinary or cross-functional teams, right? So the teaming stuff first. I've actually spent a lot of time on this. When we were teaching new product development, we quickly learned that teaming challenges were huge. You're putting students together from not just the Berkeley campus, but California College of the Arts. Now I've got really different perspectives, different ways of working, et cetera. So I, I actually worked with a colleague from outside the university who had done a lot of teaming work. And she was incredibly helpful in designing a curriculum that we could put into the class that, you know, in short, focuses on creating a collaborative plan to launch the team, getting clear about shared goals as well as individual goals, having check-ins regularly on how well are we communicating, how well are we allocating work, how well are we adhering to our shared goals or do we need to change them, as well as individual 360 feedback. Ten years later, by the way, we went and did a retrospective on what did you learn from that class, and the number one thing was how to work in a cross-disciplinary team. Like you'd name design for manufacturability, name a bunch of other stuff, but it was the number one thing was how do you work in a team? And we don't actually teach that very well in general, right? We throw students into groups and we say we're teaching teaming, but we, we aren't very well. And, and ultimately, Berkeley Haas hired a, a woman who who runs a teaming curriculum in the business school. I've taken that curriculum outside the business school and I work with my engineering colleagues, et cetera, as well as other universities to embed it into their, into their classes. So that's, teaching teaming can be done. It's not a natural part of almost any of our classes. And so embedding that and thinking about how to embed it is an important part. And clearly it matters to this solving problems that matter kind of Framework. Hi, it's Austin, your host, with a brief interruption. Since this podcast is free and not supported by ads, I have a very quick ask for you. If you're finding value in this conversation, please consider sharing it with another leader or aspiring leader who you think would enjoy it so that we can learn and lead better together. And if you're a software founder considering a successful exit to a partner who will love your team just as much as you do, I would love to hear from you. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or send me an email at austin at magrathiapartners.com. That's Austin at Magrathea, M-A-G-R-A-T-H-E-A, magratheapartners.com. Thanks, and now back to the show. The one that's more gnarly, harder to tackle, is how do we teach people how to frame and solve problems? So such, an, such an important question and topic, and I would love your deep dive on that. Uh, yeah. So design thinking became this sort of hot thing, whatever, 12 years ago. And and a part of me was a little bit puzzled by it because we had been teaching new product development and human-centered design for a long time. So I'm like, what is this thing? And, and it was being positioned as the way to think rather than a way to think. And so I said, hmm, well, I'll teach an experimental course called Design and Systems Thinking for MBAs. And so we went through some amount of what is systems thinking, went through some amount of what is design thinking. And then I, I said, well, you know, there is critical thinking highlighted in every high school that I'm aware of that, that you learn that, colleges too. 
So I sent the students off to look at this University of Hong Kong website on critical thinking. And they came back to class the next day. And, and I said, how was that? And one of the students raises his hand and he said, I felt like I'd come home again. And other students in the class are nodding their heads. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. Where did you hear that before? They couldn't answer. So I thought that was really interesting, right? That they felt more, way more comfortable with the notion of critical thinking than with designer systems thinking. But then they couldn't point to where they learned it. By the way, I think mostly they learn it in history, English, right? Classes where they're learning to build structure arguments and do that kind of analytics, which is a plug for retaining the humanity somewhere in our, in our curriculum. And then I started watching my high school age sons and, and sort of like, where are they learning thinking in their curriculum? And, and I concluded that at the end of four years, that the only problem framing and solving process that, that they could formally articulate was scientific method right? Because scientific method very explicitly says, you know, do some observation, create a hypothesis, design some experiments, run those experiments, cycle through again. So I started thinking, well, this is very interesting. You know, for that future we described at the beginning of this conversation, that future, you know, we ought to be really good at framing and solving problems because we have a lot of them and we have to frame and solve them a lot faster than we used to. So how do I really think generically about problem framing and solving instead of letting it be a fad that we engage in, right? So I've got scientific method, critical thinking, both of which have been around for a long time, analytical thinking, creative thinking, which kind of got absorbed into design thinking, systems thinking, right? I've got all, and then there's total quality management, which was a problem framing and solving methodology that got used pretty, as an industrial engineer, I used to teach quality management. I said, how do we think about the fundamental underlying capabilities that are associated with problem framing and solving? And we began to use uh, David Kolb's experiential learning theory to do this. And there's a lot to that theory that I, I won't go into, but fundamentally it comes down to there being sort of four fundamental capabilities I need and that I need for any one of those thinking. Observe and notice. This is in the concrete world. Taking in information, which we do all day long, right? It can be of any kind of form. Scientists look at the plants. Uh, anthropologists look at humans, right? So observe and notice. Then I have to take the messy, messy data that comes from observe and notice, and I have to frame and reframe. What are the insights that I get from that? What are the patterns that I see, right? Ultimately, what is a problem that might be solved or that I might tackle, right? So scientists might talk about that as hypotheses, you know, design thinking. People talk about that as insights. Uh, so we all use different words in the different thinking effect we're all doing. Observe and notice, frame and reframe it. Going back and forth between those, I call that sense-making. It's also called that in the management literature. So, so how do I make sense of the world I'm in? And that's a reflective act, right? That's a getting to why act, which frankly, we don't prioritize very much because most of us live on the other side. So now I've got this problem that I framed. Now I have to imagine and design alternative ways of, of tackling that problem. So that's but this all in our heads right? For imagining and designing things. At some point, we have to say, okay, let me go back into the concrete world in which I did observe and notice. And let me experiment with those. Let me make something. We could talk all day about the future of education, but one of us, you, Austin, has to go actually do something with it, right? So, so we began to think that if that's problem framing and solving, then how do I think about developing those capabilities? So if I'm teaching design thinking, I'll focus on interview customers, observe them, come up with an insight, generate ideas, rapidly prototype them. Lean startup starts in the other corner. Ooh, you have an idea? I insist that you make one and take it out there and try it out. And oh, by the way, while you're trying it out, listen to people and you might pivot, frame and reframe, right? Critical thinking, a lot of focus on facts, inferences, assumptions, how you unpack those. That's a sense-making behavior. 
They have less to say about the creativity of generating ideas, a lot to say about the analytics of evaluating them, right? So systems thinking, now I'm observing a system, not just a human, and I'm trying to figure out what are the leverage points in that system that might allow me to change its behavior to support a reduction in, in ozone layer, right? Or something along those lines. So, so that's kind of how I, I've tried to take this step back and say, wait a second, problem framing and solving are really important. Sometimes design thinking methods are good. Other times quality management is still good. Maybe I do need a Pareto chart and a Six Sigma evaluation, right? Systems thinking, absolutely critical to, I'm putting autonomous cars out there. What are all the things that will change as a result of autonomous vehicles? Oh, this is one of my favorites. There might be fewer accidents. As a result of fewer accidents, there might be fewer organ donations. Hmm. So the, the system effects of what we're putting out there, you can think about Facebook, you can think about ChatGPT, you can think about any of these things. Without appreciating the system's effects, we, we, we set ourselves up for, for real challenges down the road. So that's, so that's the layer down there. So now I've got solving problems that matter, demand pull for core content, and iterative development as I solve those problems of my problem framing and solving capabilities and my teaming capabilities. Now you're going to ask, what are the challenges with that? I would love to know what are the challenges with that. Thank you. You lined up my next question perfectly. <laughs> so, so, you know, the university is set up to focus on core content, right? So I have a lot, I call them sage on the stage faculty who get up, lecture, give a test, and that's the delivery of that core content. There's increasing investment in problem-based classes. They're not always very well connected to the demand pull on the core content, right? So we have a real opportunity to say, if, if those are the ways we're going to teach, let's, let's connect them better. Today, they're often a capstone course, like I described earlier, that says, don't you remember what you learned three years ago? Because you need it now, which isn't really useful to the student. So how do I pull that, those solving problems that matter earlier in programs? to get over the notion that that's capstone. So Olin, College of Engineering does this. First day of class. I don't know if they still do this, but they used to. They'd say, you have six weeks to build a steam engine. You know, parts lying around the room that you might need. But, but And so then the students spend six weeks and they have to learn all, you know, fluid dynamics, piston motion. They have to learn all the stuff that you might need to build that, to build that steam engine. So how do we imagine building this stuff in earlier in the in the process, then honestly, we kind of don't need Sage on the stage. Look what happened in COVID. I turned Sage on the stage into video and that still exists, right? So students in 700 person class watch it streaming from their dorm room. So I don't, I don't really need Sage on the stage kinds of learning anymore because it's being done online or in different formats that are maybe more modular, more accessible. What we are most missing is the stuff that nobody really wants to teach, problem framing and solving and teaming. And because that's orthogonal to the core content, my experience has been it's been very difficult to get faculty to talk about that. Part of it's also that we all frame and solve problems and don't pay attention to how we do it. So how should I teach it if I can't even articulate my own process? So that's my hope had been that by coming up with this sort of more generic view of, of problem framing and solving, where you can put any tool set or set of approaches in those boxes, that we might begin to create a common language that could allow faculty to be better at articulating, well, in this class, this is what that cycle will look like. You know, it would be some physics class where you're determining the friction of a block sliding down an inclined plane. And so what is it that you're going to do in order to bridge the elements of the, of the problem framing and solving process to, to get there? It's a lot of work. Source problems that matter. It's a lot of work. So, and there are companies that have started up that do that for universities now. So that will be a critical part of that. Converting faculty from sage on the stage 
to guide on the side is huge. Guide on the side is a very different job of working with a team, helping them see that they need to pull on you know, this different content in order to tackle a problem. And it's very different than being the sage, I, right? I'm getting this, <clears throat> this picture of, you know, historically it's been very focused on core content, stage on the stage, one-way lecturing, and your vision for what higher ed could be in the future is very much more project-based. It's pulling people together, seeding them with a problem that really matters, or having them come up with a problem that matters that they want to explore, having the teacher or educator really be a facilitator in the process, exploring that problem, and through their team and the diverse perspectives represented there, figuring out how to solve that problem. And that would pull on all of the different areas that are covered by the core content, but it would be tied to this one particular problem. Is that, is that about right? Totally. Totally. I love that. Yes. Yes. Like, what does it really look like? I'm really flipping education, right? So that it's much more experiential. It's, it's, it, by the way, it doesn't have to be team-based, right? I mean, I can give individuals small projects that don't require. So it's, it, it doesn't have to totally become big teams working on big projects, right? I could have them design a steam engine on their own. Then there's, by the way, which I think people miss, there's peer-to-peer -peer learning in here too. And so how do you build in peer-to-peer -peer learning? So it's not even just the guides on the side, that are facilitating the learning, but there's peer-to-peer um, -peer work as well, which, which I think we probably underappreciate, particularly if we have a sage on the stage mindset, right? Then we don't think about, it's amazing today. I mean, I, I have freshmen who come in, <laughs> they've been programming, tracked programming since high school. They've taken eight college courses before they get to Berkeley. They play like, we have to, our heads are in the sand if we don't think these, these students can teach one another, can work on projects and collectively really deepen their learning and understanding of core content, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll sign up for the classes like that myself. That sounds like so much fun. So, so we're moving in this digital direction. You know, there, there are these different important frameworks to to facilitate, to guide into the classroom. I guess I'd be curious what opportunities and technology exist out there today, or what examples in the real world exist of this model of education that could be, you know, a helpful illustrative example for how you would like to see education evolve. What are the opportunities and technologies out there today to help us get to that place? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you probably know more about that than I do, honestly, but know that there's a lot of stuff starting to happen on the teaming front, partly because I've been playing in that space. And so I'm seeing a lot of apps and platforms that are intended to support teams and, and how they work together. Some of them are still a little bit too driven in my mind by there are slackers when they work on teams, or I don't want to give everybody the same grit. Like they're a little bit driven still by outdated models of thinking about student learning. But but in teaming space, I see a lot of that. Not seeing that in the problem framing and solving space. There are a lot of toolkits out there, some automated, some not. For example, design thinking, there's lots of toolkits out there. Tools are good, but there's deeper capabilities that sit under the four capabilities or deeper skills that sit under these four capabilities that I named. And yeah, so for example, I ask people to create a web of abstraction. So take a problem. Why does somebody want to solve that problem? Why, why, why? What's stopping them? People struggle with just the logic of executing a web of abstraction. I would love this is an incredibly simple tool that would help give people feedback in real time. Like that's not the answer to why. That's not a logical answer to why somebody would want to do X, right? I would love to see attention being paid to that. There's a ton of effort that's being put into learning core content, if you will, in much more interesting, engaging ways. Guide on the side work. I spent some amount of time looking at like mentoring systems and that kind of thing because the guide on the side depends how, how you, if they're full time, then you don't need this so much. But 
if you're drawing in people like I used to draw in designers from industry, they need to know where the students are in the project, what's being asked for them as milestones for their work. Maybe they need to know what the underlying learning outcomes are that we want them to achieve. So the whole ability to support guides on the side in a meaningful way, no different, honestly, than getting good educators, which is another topic, but, but how do you support people in really helping other people learn. By the way, that's not just an education thing, is it? It's, do my bosses help me learn? Does my company help me learn? Like, what support do I have in in solving the challenges I have in any organization? So I think we have all the technologies. The question is, two questions, really. One is, are we thinking about them with a different frame, like the frame of more experience-based learning or the frame of core content is all like, what, what if we shift frames? And so some of them, particularly the ones that are targeting universities, are living in, in existing norms or existing frames, right? So I think that those are the questions of, because I can't, how do I get the university to change to use my software? Well, I'd rather sell them software that they don't have to change because then they'll buy it. So how do we, where does the force come in making change in, in some of these environments? And that, yeah. Love that. Love that. It's and you had mentioned when we chatted last, the example of the National University of Singapore as doing some interesting work around impacting teacher learning. I'd love to hear observations on, on NUS and how that's potentially an interesting example for the rest of higher ed to be looking at. Yeah. So what NUS is doing, National University of Singapore, they have created what they call an educator track. And the educator track promotes faculty on the basis of evidence of student learning. So this is very different than, for example, at UC Berkeley, where we promote people on the basis of good student evaluation, not on the basis of, of student learning. So student evaluations have actually, most of the literature suggests that student evaluations are not correlated with student learning. So just because I get high evaluations doesn't mean my students learn more than than somebody who had lower evaluations. So, so the notion of student learning really causes you to flip this whole thing on its head, right? Because if I'm thinking about, everybody thinks they already do this. I'll just say that. Everybody like, oh, I have learning objectives. But, but if I really take a given learning objective, like the example of web of abstraction and framing a problem, like how could I evaluate whether students are able to reframe the problem that they're solving. What kind of evaluation would I give them? And there's many, many, many ways of doing evaluation, right? But, but it's not just a test at the end of the semester. That might be one form of evaluation, but it's just watching them do work during class or um, giving them simple challenges to figure out if they're, they're getting it or not. So, so first, I have to be super clear about what is it that I want students to learn? Ideally, beyond memorization, though that is a part of some of the courses, right? But then I have to get creative about how am I going to lead them to have learned that at the end of an hour and a half I have together with them, for example. Building that into these problem-based, project-based classes is even more important because students could work all semester on a problem, but not everybody on the team will have learned about framing the problem or will, will not have learned about maybe some fundamental engineering content that's part of that project, right? So, so really taking a student learning perspective turns out to be quite a radical shift. It's way harder to really be thoughtful about that and spend time saying, oh, so how will I construct my 90-minute class to optimize the probability that at the end of the class, the students can distinguish two economic theories? That takes way more time than making a PowerPoint of two economic theories with examples in it. And so help for faculty in really thinking those through, giving them creative ways to do it, helping them execute those if they're accustomed to being a lecturer, helping them embed this kind of work into their classes. All the tech is there, right? I've got clickers, I've got voting, I've got, like I have a lot of ways to do that, but I have to smoothly embed it in, in my 90 minute. And that's 
easier said than done. That yeah. sounds like the, the evolution of problem solving, innovation, design, critical thinking, and higher ed has, has been very much about keeping people at the center of design. Sounds like what, what you're describing here is placing learning at the center of education instead of evaluation at the center of education. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a pretty radical shift. It causes you to have That's to unpack a whole bunch of behaviors, rules, systems that we have and use them in a very different way. Yeah. This is this is indeed a very positive vision for the future of higher education. This has been super fun. And before we hop off, any closing thoughts you would leave our audience with? I'm a glass half full kind of person. I think we have the elements of what we need. We need we need pockets of experimentation, like the Olin College of Engineering, where we can play with things. And we have some of those, but we spend a lot of our time, not just at UC Berkeley, but elsewhere, kind of writing existing rules in order to try them out. So to the extent that we can create beds of experimentation, sandboxes, where we can play with things without parents thinking it will endanger their kids' future career or students thinking that they wish they weren't paying tuition for something weird um, or faculty feeling comfortable that they're doing good things, but not taking too much time away from their research, right? There's a lot of need for rapid experimentation in higher ed. So I would, I would leave us with, think about the possibilities for creating that experimentation space and where it might take us. Beautiful. I think that that is the perfect optimistic note to leave our audience with. Um, there is indeed hope for education for the future of higher ed. This has been really just a pleasure to spend some time with you in the beginning of 2024. I'm very grateful to you. I found a lot of learning and value in this conversation. I know that our audience will as well. Thank you so much for your time, your thoughts, and your positive vision. It was my pleasure, Austin.